I know we're sick of saying it, but it's like 2020 has been pretty average, right? It's like, it's been one of those um, really interesting years. No one really saw it coming. Um, any kid, you know, that has to study 2020 is going to be upset because there's so much to wade through in terms of what's going on. Um, and on one level, um, it's sort of, I think we're even even over the, the idea that it's been a tough year. It's like, oh, yeah, it's been a tough year. Let's stop talking about it. Can we just like, la, 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 life is beautiful, whatever. Um, but let's just, you know, uh, let's have a look at what we've dealt with so far. A, um, a, a pandemic. We've had, um, we've finished the election cycle in New Zealand. Come on. Hallelujah. I mean, whatever. When it comes to results, just hallelujah. That part is over. Um, you may be happy today. You may be sad. Um, there's been a lot of racial pain exposed this year. Uh, there's been a lot of protests around the world, not just in the States. Um, uh, what, is, what is true and what's not and the rise of misinformation has, has been pretty perplexing. Social media continues to wreck our lives. Uh, we've gone through lockdowns. Where, uh, we've had um, massive isolation. All of our normal rhythms have been absolutely shot at different points of the year. Uh, it's, been, it's been tough. In the midst of other, like in the midst of any pressure, what normally happens is that other stuff comes up as well. Yay! It's like when you're under pressure, other things bubble up. It's the liquefaction of life. And so, you know, pastorally, I'm aware of, I don't know, what percentage of the stuff going on in the room, maybe, I don't know, 5%, 10%, more than the average Joe, but it's like the amount of hard stuff most of you guys are dealing with is unreal. Take all of the stuff I just said before out of the equation, and what most people are dealing with in their lives at the moment is just really tough. Emotional problems, relational problems, mental health problems, marriage problems, money problems, you name it. It's like there's all the stuff that's just been really hard for people this year. It's been brutal. Um, and there's been a few people, um, like my wife, who've ticked along okay. God bless you and your positive pants, Jen. Um, really happy for you. She was like, really? It's been that tough, is it? Like she's reading through my notes. And I'm like, yes, it has. Like, it's been tough. I'm like... God bless you. She's like, I like the lockdown. I know, I'm like, I know you did. I hated it. And the contrast just amplified my pain. It's like, why did... It's been hard. It's been hard for most of us. It's been just... If you haven't gone through anything else, it's been hard, I think. And then most people have gone through all sorts of other stuff. And as Luke was saying last week, storms reveal our foundations. And again, that can be discouraging. <laughs> It's like, I thought I was a pretty good Christian, and then, you know, I go through all this stuff, and I wind up going back to Egypt. I wind up going back to the thing I used to look to to cope, and I thought I'd dealt with it, but I haven't dealt with it because I've had a bad year on that front or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, it reveals our foundations. And, uh, and the question is, like, where do you turn for refuge in a season like this? Like, Physio this scientifically, physiologically, you need to find refuge. Finding refuge is not a bad thing. We, we are wired to have a break from, hashtag escape from, pressure. Like, this, this, no, like you've got to do that. You can't stay under pressure for an infinite amount of time. You have to go somewhere to take a break. The question is, where do you find refuge? It's not, it's not will you find refuge? It's where will you find refuge? You will find refuge somewhere. And uh, the beautiful thing is that uh, King David is this great example to us of someone who turned to God as a refuge. Now, David faced enormous crisis and enormous pressure in his, in his life. So we can identify with him on lots of levels. As a king, he faced leadership pressure unlike most of us will ever experience. Unbelievable pressure of leading a nation. Now, uh, we've got people in government, and I'm like, I do not envy them. <laughs> like, regardless of what you think of Jacinda or Judah Collins or whatever, like, that is a tough gig. You're never going to please everyone. And in particular, a digital age, you are going to get hit with all sorts of horrific stuff. 
David lived in an environment where he was, he was the king and there would have been lots of people disappointed with him, lots of people frustrated with his leadership style. And we see that actually it got to the point where his own son Absalom took the throne from him in a coup. Like that's got to make you feel pretty rats, your own flesh and blood. And the fact that he had enough of a following to follow through with it. Now it didn't last long, thank goodness. But like he was under enormous pressure. And then with his own family, he faced enormous pain as he grew up from, um, from a dysfunctional family. He was at the bottom of the rung when it came to the family. Uh, uh, he was the youngest brother, which meant that you were just the bottom of the pecking order, um, just within the culture of the day. His job was the lowest of the jobs. Uh, and then when he starts kind of getting some uh, kind of fame and whatnot and starts getting known, his brothers mock him when he goes to fight Goliath. They're like, they're like taking the mickey out of him. So he's dealing with like the relational conflict that happens when siblings are a bit jealous of you. So he's got that going on in his life. He faced enormous hardship as Saul the king pursues to try and kill him. We see him hiding in, in caves, running for his life. As a human being, he faced the huge consequences of adultery and manslaughter. Like he, the pain and anguish that comes from making those sort of calls are huge. Some of us in the room know what it feels like to make really dumb decisions and have to just, st- just sit with the reality of your choices as you see the people you love most get really hurt. The gut-wrenching realisation of what your choices mean. This is what David went through. Is anyone else encouraged? Isn't that just nice to think? Like, we can read all the Psalms and life of David. We detach ourselves from the reality of the experience that David went through. And through it all, we read, through it all, through the the dumb mistakes, through the leadership pressure, through the running for his life, from all of it, he, we read that time and time again, he found a refuge in God. 46 times in the Psalms, he, he either writes a psalm or he would sing a psalm that others had written about God being a refuge. And this is why David is called a man after God's own heart. There were just, I was working through some of the, the examples and there's just so many. <laughs> They're beautiful. Trust in him at all, at all times, O oh people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in Him. Are you happy because you've taken a refuge in God? Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and a strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 57, verse 1, be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. What a line, the humility. I've made all sorts of dumb choices. Be merciful, be merciful. I could run, instead of letting my sin propel me away from you, I'm going to let my sin propel me towards you. And I'm going to take, even in my, in my sin and in my darkest moment, I'm going to find mercy and I'm going to find refuge in you, O oh God. For I will, in the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge until the destroying storms pass. On and on and on, psalm after psalm. And for David, this is not a theory, This isn't theology, this is an experienced reality. God is his refuge, his hiding place. This is where God will go. It's a a place of tranquility. It's a place of healing. It's a place of restoring. But then there's this really interesting psalm, Psalm 52. It says, See the one who would not take refuge in God, but trusted in abundant riches and sought refuge in wealth! Exclamation mark. What a dummy. It's like, but I'm like a green olive tree in the house of the Lord. I trust in the steadfast love of the Lord, love of God. Here's the reality. You can take refuge in lots of other things that aren't God. And Luke said this last week. We can take a good thing and make it a God thing. So it doesn't even necessarily be, be a, necessarily a sinful activity. You can find refuge in fly fishing, eh, Luke? You know, where it's like, I'm just, uh, theoretically, you know, don't want to throw him under the bus or anything, but it's like we can, mentally, it's like that's where we're going to escape. Now, nothing wrong with that, but it's, it's not actually meant to be the refuge. Surfing, uh, you know, PlayStation games, I don't know. It's like things that aren't bad, that they're good things, but they can be, when they become a God thing, then we've got an issue. And then there's certainly other things that, are, uh, um, that will harm us if we, if we take prolonged refuge in them. 
alcohol, um, carbs. <laughs> oh, Lord, list, Lord, list of the old. Um, shopping, consumerism, busyness. Our songs, our, our souls will find refuge in those things, and often we turn to them. And the reality is that these refuges will work. They anesthetize us, they distract us, they can medicate us. There's a reason that we go to them. We don't go to them because they don't work, we go to them because they do. The problem is that they will not be refuge, ref, they're not, well, they will not be places of refuge that heal or restore. They will not be places that heal or restore. And so uh, God is the, is the place we can go to and it will be restoring, it will be healing. And that's why there's a battle on for this place. That's why there's a battle on for this place. Uh, Dallas Willard said this, Desire is infinite, is infinite partly because we were made by God, made for God, made to need God, and made to run on God. We can be satisfied only by the one who is infinite, eternal, and able to supply all our needs. We are only at home in God. When we fall away from God, the desire for the infinite remains, but it is displaced upon things that will certainly lead to destruction. So uh, how do we outwork this? How do we, uh, how do we in real terms live in such a way that God is our refuge? And um, I think partly it's, it's to do with this. We must arrange our life so that sin no longer looks good to us. I love that. We must arrange life so that sin no longer looks good to us. I am utterly convinced to my core that when Jesus says, I am the, the life, that he, he wasn't kidding I'm utterly convinced that when he said, I've come to bring life in all of its fullness, he absolutely meant it. I believe in a prosperity gospel, not in health, wealth, and, 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 and all that sort of stuff. I believe in a prosperity gospel of our souls and in a prosperity gospel of our relationships. That's where God pours out his prosperity. And particularly when it comes to our souls, I believe that we can live in such a way that is so rich that the more you experience it, the more the things that you used to look to to bring life seem so, so like a shadow in comparison. They like seem so, so weak compared to the, the rich, deep, abundant life of God. There is a way to live so that sin no longer looks good to us. It just starts losing its attraction. Now, that's a lifelong process of sanctification, as Rachel Hunter said. It won't happen overnight, but it will happen. You're starting to become almost a cultural motive of our church. Oh, God bless it. <laughs> uh, I've always got to do that. We've got to keep choosing Jesus. We've got to keep choosing His way. And that's why as we finish the year, I just had this burning sense in my heart. Lord, as a church, I know we gather every week and we're choosing you, but we're leaning in even more as we finish the year. We're leaning in every more because uh, we don't want to just bin the year. We want to see the year redeemed and restored. We want to finish the year saying, yes, I have a stronger foundation. I have met with Jesus. And anything that I've done that's been the wrong refuge is covered by His grace and mercy. Hallelujah. And I am tracking towards the strong foundation that is Jesus. So that when the storms of life come in 2021, and they will, that there's this, a deeper roots. There's, there's a deeper percent of, of stability and strength in our rhythms of Jesus. So here's some practical ways that we can do it, and then the sermon's going to finish. Come on, church. How good's that? We're getting near the, the runway. We can even see it. All right. Here we go. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, okay. So the first point, which I haven't put out here, is this. To, to How do we do this? Firstly, we need to prioritize our relationship with God. Number one, just prioritize our relationship with God. Rich Velota said this, What I love about the Pentecostal tradition is the belief that if we create space, especially in our gatherings, God will meet us in power. What I love about the contemplative tradition is the belief that if we create space, especially interior space, God will meet us in love. And what I love about the missional tradition is the belief that if we enter the local space, especially the neighborhood, God will meet us in the face of the other. I love this. Like this is like the, the, the legs on a, uh, on a stool, on a tripod, whatever you want, a metaphor you want to use. And it's like those three help us meet God. And what we want to do uh, and why we've changed our service for a season is because we want to create a bit more space 
in our meetings here to meet with God. I want you coming to church with the expectation, I'm going to meet with God. I'm going to meet Him in power. I want you. I really want to stir up your faith to say, yes, He is alive, He is holy, He's greater than any challenge I'm, I'm going through. And He, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, knows me by name and wants to meet me. He wants to meet me in a tangible, experienced way. That's why we're going to finish with worship and we've got some stations and different things you're going to do in a second. Uh, but, but, but I also want to say, uh, let's not just lean into Him as we finish the year in our meetings. Let's lean into Him in our devotional lives throughout the week. Let's get more contemplative. Let's create space to sit in silence with the expectation as I still myself and as I create interior space, God is going to meet me in love. He's going to meet with me in love. One of the most radical things you can do today is sit on, in silence for two to five minutes with the expectation that God is going to come and meet with you. Just sit in a space, go to a desert place, a quiet place, a place of solitude and silence, and everyone can find that space, even the craziest mum, and sit there for two to five minutes with the sole intention, I'm going to meet with you. It may be on the loo. I'm going to meet with you. I'm going to meet with you, God, sh- whatever. I'm going to meet with you. And, and every day, and this, that is saying, I'm, that's saying, you're my refuge, God. You're my refuge. I'm going to hide here in the shelter under the, the wings of the Almighty God. I'm going to practice refuge in my interior life. With and then lastly, uh, this missional tradition. We don't just we're not just living for a buzz for ourselves. We're living to meet Jesus in the face of the poor and the broken in our communities. And often uh, movements have emphasized one of these and excluded the focus on the other. I want us to hold all of these in tension. We can do that. You can go to work tomorrow and and a, and, a, have, and look out, Lord. Where's the person in my workplace that is often just overlooked or is hard work or whatever it may be? Lord, I want to meet you there. I want to meet you in the face of that person. I want to go in love, and you'll be transformed as you go there. So, so the first thing is to prioritize engage you like meeting with God. And the second thing is to realign our lives to the life of God. The problem has been often in the church, as followers of Jesus, we've, uh, we've believed He's the truth, but we're wondering where the life is because we're not walking in the way. Like you've got to rearrange your whole life around God if you want Him to be a refuge. We need to move beyond consumerism where we come and have some, you know, I'm, here, I'm, I'm saved and I go to church as part of my kind of gig, to like my whole life is orientated around you, Jesus. I'm your disciple. I'm your apprentice. I want to learn how to live well by following your example. I want to, to, to change how my lifestyle so that it looks like the lifestyle of Jesus. And this is what it means to be a disciple, to be an apprentice, to follow the way of Jesus. If you want to find refuge, then like you can't, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. Dave Riddell. It's like if you keep, if it hasn't worked, then maybe go, Jesus, show me what I need to do to change my life so there's more peace in my life, more margin in my life. There's this sense of, uh, uh, especially, can I just say, the Sabbath, rest. If you're not in a home church, can you get in one? This whole term, most uh, home churches are looking at the module, the Sabbath. It's life-changing. It'll utterly transform your life if you practice Sabbath. Your soul will be restored. It's in the Ten Commandments. It's like the moral baseline. It's like we take all the other nine commandments very, very seriously. Like if I was committing adultery, murder, bowing down to another idol, you know, uh, envious of, you know, constantly jealous, really, would have an issue, right? If I work seven days a week, well done, Harvey, you're so committed, you're going, well, look at you go, you're just, well, you're busy, you must be really important. Ooh. And it's like, Anyway, there's nine weeks of material there that I'm trying to download where it's like there's a radical countercultural way to live and the fact that there's not enthusiasm about the fact that Jesus invites us to rest is a, is a, is a great example of the systemic issue that the church has absolved, absolved the culture of the world rather than the culture of the kingdom. The culture of the kingdom is one of margin and of rest and of peace, tangible peace, where you have time for the things that matter most. And, uh, and so that's, that's going to that's gonna be a journey of your life. But I'm telling you, God is not your refuge if you're just going to live the way our society lives. 
Like you just cannot expect that your soul will flourish when you're in the kingdom of this world. I'm just sorry, that's the reality. So let's relearn what it looks like to be citizens of the kingdom and come alive in Jesus. Come alive in Him. Beware the barrenness of a, of a busy life, Socrates. Beware the barrenness of a busy life. There's so much barrenness in our world. And, but you know, there's so much life and joy found in the rhythms of Jesus the way of Jesus, the lifestyle of Jesus, which includes things like Sabbath rest, margin, devotional life, peace. Let's make it a priority. Uh, Isaiah 55, come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, come and drink. But listen, the first step, you actually just have to come because you have the option of staying. You have the option of staying. So like, again, this is not a passive, What this series is the least passive series we've done probably in the history of our church, where it's like, I'm preaching, you know, let's have a, whatever. This is like, no, let's, let's contend, let's lean in, let's come, let's not stay, let's come to him and drink deeply, come. Uh, oh, <laughs> went on a few tangents. Uh, you know, quickly, Jesus, Jesus' whole thing of ask, seek, and knock. It's not, this is, a, with our relationship with our Heavenly Father, it's not passive. It's a relationship. There's something broken in my marriage if I'm not making something of an effort. Amen, Jen? Right? And it's like me saying to Jen, oh, I said I love you on our wedding day. You know, it's like, well, that's not enough. It's a relationship. We continue to express our love for one another, our desire. And, and love is a choice. So I continue to choose her. In the same way, our relationship with God is like, I want to keep on choosing you. And like, often we have to get saved again and again and again and again. And maybe today you want to come back to Jesus and dedicate your life to Him and orientate your life around Him. It's not something passive. It's ask, seek, and knock. It's contend. It's choose. It's lean in. But then Jesus says, how much more does your heavenly Father want to give the Holy Spirit to those that ask? Like, He wants to know that we want Him. But then the minute, like the prodigal son, we start walking home, He's running down the road saying, yeah, baby, He's back. It's like, that's what happens. Okay. Uh, so how do we find a refuge? We, we prioritise God in terms of living the way of God. Uh, we, 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 we orientate our life around Him. But thirdly, we process with God. Like you've gone through stuff this year, you need to process it. And the Psalms are a fantastic example of this, the whole book of the Psalms is like a journal where David's pouring out his heart towards the, to, to the Lord. Psalm 68 verse, 62 verse 8. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Pour out your heart to God. Lamentations 2 verse 19. In the midst of unbelievable pain that the, 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 the Israelite nation were going through as they went through exile, Arise, cry out in the night as the watches of the night begin. Pour out your heart like water in the presence of God. <sighs> Just let it all out. One of the uh, tables that was set up over here uh, is for journaling. And we've got a whole lot of cardboard and a whole lot of pens. And as we worship in a minute, you've got the option if you want to, to go over, grab cardboard and some pen, go wherever you want and just pour out your heart to the Lord. And now you, and at the end of that, you may want to keep it or you may want to bin it. Or, and in future, we're going to do different things every, uh, every Sunday. One, one Sunday, we're going to have a shredder and we're just going to shred some stuff, man, because some stuff needs to get shred. Uh, but this isn't necessarily a shreddy thing. This is just a pour out your heart towards the Lord thing. Um, and lastly, um, lastly, we want to sing, sing to the God. I really screwed up my PowerPoint because I realized halfway through <laughs> preparing my PowerPoint last night that there was an election on. I completely forgotten about it. And then I tuned in and then I completely forgot about my PowerPoint, it turns out, because it's an absolute shambles. Anyway, <laughs> my last point is uh, as we sing to God. Psalm 59, 16, which I don't have up there, uh, says this, But I will sing of your might. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning, for you have been a fortress for me and a refuge in the day of my distress. O oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you, O God. You are my fortress, the God who shows me steadfast love. Like There's something powerful about worship. 
There's something like it's warfare. There's something that's like, yes, this is who you are. Yes, this is what you're about. There's something about worship that is just, and and Jesus himself said, I'm looking for worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth. So people who aren't trying to fake it with God, you're just genuinely, deeply authentic with where you're at and you're pouring out your heart to him in the midst of it all. And in spirit, the sense where you're not just going through the motions, but you're like, yes. There's something in my soul getting stirred up and I'm blessing you through this. And so this, obviously we're going to finish uh, this morning by having uh, an extended time of worship, but it's not just about songs. It's about, it's about declaring boldly the truth of who God is over our circumstances and over what we're going through. And it re- it just, it, it's like it, 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 the mist clears in worship and it's like, oh, that's right. And then I'm going through all this stuff, but as I declare that there is no love but your love, that's right. And that it would just, you know. Blah. Okay. So we're going to, as we finish this morning, uh, in terms of the sermon part of things, um, I want to invite us to come to, to uh, meet with God. In Ephesians 2 verse 7, it says, Come that he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Like that you would experience this morning the kindness of God and the riches of his grace. Come this morning and experience that. Come, Jeremiah 31, 25, come and I will refresh the weary and satisfy the faint. Like as we come to God, he satisfies and he refreshes and he he renews us. I really have a sense as we finish this uh, year together as a church family that we are to feast on the goodness of God. Like it's a season of feasting on the goodness of God and, uh, and to lean into that both as we gather but then as we go that we would feast on the goodness of God and would finish the year just like, yes, you're good. Like I still, that doesn't mean you understand everything and I've got questions around suffering and, and, and disappointment with God, you know, about like, how the heck is this meant to work? And I thought you were la da da. And it's like, in the midst, again, in truth, right? I'm not like, ee, in truth. But it's like, but oh, you're still so good. <laughs> you're still so good. And, and though you slay me, I'll trust you, says Job. And, and, and through it all, you're faithful. And, and that we'll just re- feast on his goodness because everything else we look to hurts. It doesn't satisfy. It may anesthetize for a while. It may distract for a little while. It may medicate, but it never satisfies. God is a refuge that will meet us and we will be satisfied in him. We will encounter his matchless mercy. We will will experience his indescribable love.